You know, when I talk about the need to create a political revolution in this country, and when I talk about the fact that this is not just an election to elect a president, but to build a grassroots movement which will demand that Congress represents the people of this country rather than a handful of billionaires. What I am talking about in 50 states in the country is what CCI is doing right here in Iowa. Guys, thank you very much. You are doing it. You are bringing people together from all walks of life to say that government cannot continue to be dominated by wealthy campaign contributors and big money interests. Thank you for being a model for America. What this campaign and our political revolution is about is saying that there is something profoundly wrong in this country. When the middle class continues to disappear, when people work longer hours for low wages, when we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country, and at the same time, almost all new income and wealth is going to the top 1%. That's wrong. Together, we're going to change that. What we have now is a rigged economy attached to a corrupt campaign finance system. You know, when I began this campaign, people said, well, Bernie, you're a nice guy. You comb your hair really well. You're a GQ dresser. But despite all of those redeeming qualities, you can't win because you don't have a super PAC. And what I said, and I'm the only candidate running for the Democratic nomination to say this, I said, I don't want a super PAC because I don't represent the interest of billionaires and corporate America. So what we did, what we did, and to be very honest with you, it has blown me away. What we have done is gone out to the middle class and working families of this country and said, we need fundamental changes in our economy, in our political life, in our criminal justice system, in immigration, and I'm going to fight for that, but I need your help. And you know what's <clears throat> happened over the last eight and a half months? We have received two and a half million individual contributions, more than any candidate in the history of the United States of America. So we have already accomplished an important part of the political revolution, and we've shown the establishment that you can run a strong and, I believe, winning campaign without being dependent upon millionaires and billionaires. Working people can do it. What this campaign is about is ending the disgrace of the U.S. being the only major country not to provide health care to all people as a right. Thank you, nurses. What this campaign is about is saying we will end the disgrace of having more people in jail than any other country. And those people incarcerated, as everyone knows, are disproportionately black and Latino and Native American. We are going to bring about real criminal justice reform for a broken criminal justice system.
And what we are also going to do is to tell Alexis and her family that they no longer have to live in the shadows. We're going to pass comprehensive immigration reform and a path towards citizenship for 11 million undocumented. And what this campaign is about is to tell the billionaire class they cannot have it all. They are going to start paying their fair share of taxes. We are going to have a trade policy which represents the needs of working families, not the CEOs of large corporations. We are going to expand Social Security, not cut it. And yes, together, we are going to take on the fossil fuel industry. And we are going to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel, away from the Bakken pipeline, away from Keystone pipeline, into energy efficiency and sustainable energy. Thank you very much. Senator Sanders, uh, as you know, we're going to hear from some incredible grassroots leaders with questions for you, as well as two esteemed journalists. And to begin the questions, we have Anthony Newby from Minneapolis. Hello, Senator Sanders. My name is Anthony Newby. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, in a group called Knock. And we've got about 100 folks in the room today. We want to thank you so much for coming. I want to first start by saying, Welcome to the Midwest, welcome to Iowa, and thank you. I have not decided who I'm voting for yet, but I want to thank you for being a candidate who's been the most unapologetic in my lifetime on taking on corporate interests, and I want to thank you for that. We came to Iowa from Minnesota, again, along with about 100 other folks, 25 leaders from black-led organizations from throughout the Midwest. We came for a few reasons. Number one, to develop a long-term racial justice strategy. We know that the Midwest has some of the most glaring disparities in the country. We need to put together a long-term plan. Number two, to address the prison industrial complex, which you've mentioned in your opening statements. It cannot continue. The over-policing cannot continue. And we need to put together a plan anchored in our communities to solve it. The last is to put an agenda in front of the candidates to help inform and influence the presidential election. I want to talk a little bit about the policing peace that's happening in the Midwest. Many of us from the organizations that I mentioned have faced high profile cases of police violence and police killings. Uh, the names that you will recognize are Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Tony Robinson, Daquan McDonald, Rakia Boyd, Betty Jones, and Jamar Clark in Minnesota. When I say Jamar Clark, many of the folks who knew him, family, friends, and others are in this room today. Raise your hand or say aye if you know Jamar Clark, know of him, or are demanding justice in his case. <laughs> there was an occupation that followed the death of Jamar Clark. Uh, that occupation involved taking over a police precinct, shutting down freeways, shutting down malls, shutting down airports. This is happening in cities all over the Midwest, as you as you well know. Following that occupation, some local elected officials in Minneapolis decided to carve out from the budget $600,000 to go directly to a police station that was directly responsible for the death of Jamar Clark, to reinforce the police station, add reinforced glass, windows, fences, and barriers to keep the police safe. The community rallied to block that funding and that proposal was pulled because of many of the folks in this room who demanded no more investment in a system that's broken. 
my question, Senator Sanders, is our black and brown communities throughout the Midwest are in absolute crisis. We need a president willing to take big, bold action in the moment. On behalf of the great folks of Iowa and throughout the Midwest, we're asking you to follow the model began at the 4th Precinct in Minneapolis in honor of Jamar Clark and divest from the tools of mass incarceration and punitive law enforcement and create a massive jobs and infrastructure bill. Cut the cord on things that don't work and commit $200 billion, not a million or a thousand or 600,000. We want, we want a president who would commit $200 billion or more and invest in the health of our communities. Can you make that commitment today? No, I'll invest a trillion dollars in rebuilding. Hey. Okay. All right. Look, this is the story. Thanks very much, Anthony. All right. Here's the story. Youth unemployment today is off the charts. African-American youth unemployment and underemployment is 51 percent. All right, 51 percent. So what I think, you want a radical idea? Maybe we invest in education and jobs rather than jails and incarceration. I want, here's another radical idea. Instead of having more people in jail than any other country, how about having the best educated workforce in the world? Now we talk about jobs. Real unemployment in this country is not 5%, it's close to 10%. Youth unemployment off the charts. I have introduced legislation and will make happen as president a $1 trillion investment over a five-year period to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. <laughs> to train, not everybody wants to go to college. We need plumbers, we need electricians as we as we transform our energy system away from fossil fuel, we need people installing solar panels, insulating homes. In every speech that I give, Anthony, in every speech, what I say is that it is more important for our kid to have kids to have jobs and education than to be hanging out on street corners. All right? So yes. When I talk about a political revolution and transforming America, there will be a huge focus on the needs of our young people and creating a full employment economy. No more tax breaks for billionaires. Senator, okay, I want to follow up on this. Senator Sanders, I'd like to follow up on Anthony's question. We love the $1 trillion number. That's music to our ears. The question is, will you target that investment of a trillion dollars to the communities, both urban and rural, with the highest rates of unemployment and concentrated poverty. Absolutely. If we are talking about addressing the crisis of youth unemployment and high unemployment in general, by definition, it means that we need to target that money to the communities that need it the most. <laughs> and it is not just I mean, I think rebuilding our infrastructure, hiring teachers rather than firing teachers, but also helping small and medium-sized businesses in the minority communities who are more likely to hire minority kids is a priority as well. Thank you. Next, Senator, we're going to hear from Angela McCall from St. Louis. Angela. Thank you, Senator Sanders. Hello, I'm Angela McCall, and I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Several years ago, I was a full-time college student working a part-time job and while taking care of my daughter. I got behind on paying a bill and decided to visit one of those neighborhood payday lending companies. 
I was approved for a loan. However, I did not realize that the extremely high interest rates would result in having to take out two additional loans from two other payday lending companies to help pay each one back. As a single mother, my financial shortfall was exploited by these payday lending companies. I got caught up in a system that made things worse for me, my family's quality of life, my ability to, to pay back, uh, to pay childcare, medical expenses, student loans. Payday lending loans have been intentionally directed towards poor people and communities of color. That's not right. <laughs> There is a need to bring relief to these communities. We need to have better regulations of financial systems that do not cause economic injustice or prey on poor people, but will instead invest in making affordable loans available to everyone. No one should feel that the only option is to take out predatory loans. Building wealth should be the focus. We need an administration that will protect us from economic violence and injustice. Senator Sanders, what would you do to ensure that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and other federal financial regulators interact with communities that have been stripped of wealth by abusive predatory lending and chronic disinvestment? Thank you very much, Angela. Angela, if I might, let me just tell you a brief story. Uh, about two months ago, I went to a community in Baltimore, uh, largely African American and extremely poor. Unemployment about 50%, most of the buildings shuttered up. And you know what was amazing? In fact, that was the community where Freddie Gray came from. And what was amazing when you go into that community is you cannot find a grocery store The only places you find these little shops where they're telling you, selling you booze and potato chips. And you know what else you can't find? A, a normal bank. Can't find a bank. The only financial institutions are payday lenders, okay? So what do we gotta do? The payday lenders, as all of you know, are involved in usury in this country. And anybody who studies religion, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Islam, whether it's Judaism, anyone knows anything, is in all cases, usury is regarded as a sin. So we will fight for usury legislation limiting the interest rates that any institution can charge. And this is not just the horrific behavior of the payday lenders. Some of you are paying off on credit cards 15, 20%, right? All right, so we're gonna deal with that. Second of all, 24%? Okay, second of all, we need to break up the huge financial institutions on Wall Street. reestablish Glass-Steagall and create a financial system which works for consumers, small and medium-sized businesses. Third of all, to be very specific about your question, Elizabeth Warren and I have worked on an issue which I think is a very interesting one. If you are living in a low-income community and if there are no normal banking outlets in your community. You know what I think the alternative is? Not payday lenders, I think we gotta get rid of them. The alternative is to say to the United States Postal Service, which has offices in almost every community in America, that we will use the Postal Service to get involved in basic banking services.
So if you want to cash a check, you shouldn't have to pay 50, whatever the heck it is, some outrageous interest rate or fee to cash that check. You should be treated as you would if you were in a wealthier community and there was a real bank. Second of all, if you want to make a modest loan, I'm not suggesting they get involved in big time banking, but they can get involved in basic banking, which will provide a very, very significant alternative to these payday lenders and their horrific practices. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. And I, uh, I appreciate the particular name dropping of Senator Warren. We happen to share the last name. I think we're related. So I appreciate that. Uh, we're going to hear from, next from Reka Basu. She has two questions for you. Give Reka some love from the Des Moines Register, everybody. Welcome, Senator Sanders. It's good to see you again. Um, Hillary Clinton, who is regrettably not here today, <laughs> made, made the claim yesterday that when President Obama wrote his op-ed about not being able to support someone who doesn't back his gun control measures, he was referring to you. Her campaign has cited five votes that you cast against the Brady Bill, as well as several to prevent gun violence victims from seeking civil damages against manufacturers. You suggested previously that your votes um, have reflected pro-gun attitudes in Vermont, which you represent. But some of your opponents wonder, where is that fierce independent-mindedness that you show on every other issue when it comes to gun. And could you talk to us sure about where your heart is sure and I your could. evolution on this? All right, so let's set the record straight in a political season, all right? <laughs> Occasionally in political seasons, records get distorted. Record, in the state of Vermont, we have one congressperson. 1988, when I was mayor of Burlington, I ran for Congress. I ran as an independent. I'm the longest serving independent history of the United States Congress. But I ran against a Democrat and a Republican. And you know what the gun people in that election said in 1988? Vote for the Republican, vote for the Democrat. Don't vote for Bernie Sanders, because he believes that we should ban the sale of assault weapons. I lost that election by three points. That was back in 1988, when I uniquely among candidates for that seat came out against the ban came out for a ban on assault weapons. Number two, I know I'm being attacked as being a, a stooge for the NRA. Well, some stooge. I have a D minus voting record, lifetime voting record for the NRA. Not quite a stooge. Number three, as a member of the House and the Senate, I have voted for instant background checks, and I absolutely agree with what the president is trying to do in his executive order. <laughs> which is to deal with a very common sense uh, approach. And that is right now, while we try to improve and expand the instant background check with the goal that the vast majority of the American people support of making sure that nobody who should not own a gun is able to buy a gun. All right, that's the goal. Problem is, right now you have a situation where in gun shows and on the internet, people can circumvent the instant background check. I think that that is absurd. And I have voted to end the gun show loophole, and I want to see a situation where every person who purchases a gun in the United States of America undergoes an instant background check. I don't think that's a radical idea. <laughs> Fourthly, right now you have a situation where somebody can walk into a gun shop, go through an instant background check, and legally purchase guns. Okay, walk out of the door and then sell those guns to criminals. That's called a person being a straw man. I want to make straw men 
process a federal law. I wanted to make sure that straw men are prosecuted for violating federal law. People should not legally buy guns and then sell them to criminals. <laughs> Fifthly, I get calls in my office, as I'm sure other senators and congressmen do, from folks who say, you know, my brother I am really worried about. I don't know what he will do to himself or to other people, and yet we're searching frantically and we cannot find mental health treatment that we can afford when we need it. I think we need a revolution in how we do mental health. So I believe, by the way, coming from a rural state that has virtually no gun control, that I am uniquely positioned to bring about a consensus of the American people. Not everybody is going to agree. It's a divisive issue. But I believe I am in a unique position to put together a consensus of the American people who will come together and say, we will do everything that we can to end these horrendous mass shootings that we are seeing, that we will do everything we can to make sure that guns do not get into the hands of people who should not have them. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Um, I want to shift gears for a minute and talk about foreign affairs, and in particular, the role of U.S. foreign policy when it comes to upholding human rights and women's rights internationally. So I'm wondering um, what you think that that role should be and whether you believe that in situations like Boko Haram in Nigeria kidnapping schoolgirls or the Taliban's repression of women in Afghanistan, or honor killings, mass rapes, female feticide, female genital mutilation, child marriage, in various parts of the world, should they ever warrant direct US intervention? And I'm talking about any kind of intervention, military intervention, withholding of foreign aid, diplomatic pressure, and how would you balance the line between necessary global pressure and heavy-handed intervention on behalf of populations in sovereign states that don't have a voice? That's a light question. That is an excellent question. It's a difficult question, and it can't be answered simply. I think what makes our country great is that we have had a history for so many years, a far from perfect history to be sure, but a history which has stood up and fought for human dignity. Now, we have failed in many ways, but we have also been a beacon of hope for people all over the world. And as president, I once again will shine that torch as high as I can to say that the United States of America believes in human dignity, and we believe in social justice, and we believe in equal rights, and we will end and help countries all over the world end all forms of bigotry and prejudice. That's what I want the United States to be seen as, the country all over the world. Now, I will also say, and broaden your question a little bit, that we talk about foreign affairs in a very dangerous, an ugly world. You should all know that you're looking at a former congressman who heard what George W. Bush and Dick Cheney and others said about the need to invade Iraq. I listened to them and I believed that they were not telling the truth. I voted against the war in Iraq. And to answer, your, to answer your question about military interventionism and regime change, what I believe is we have got to learn the very painful lesson of the war in Iraq. And what that lesson is to me is that the United States of America cannot and should not do it alone. We cannot do it alone. And what that means, not only on the issues that you have raised, but broader issues, 
that we have got to work in coalition, broad coalition. Cannot be just America. Cannot be just our young men and women engaged in perpetual warfare in the Middle East, as some of our Republican colleagues want. So when you're looking at a horrific, I mean, an unimaginable uh, organization uh, like ISIS, uh, whose barbarism includes sexual slavery, uh, I don't think they think of women as second-class citizens, probably as 10th-class citizens, all right? And when we think about a group like ISIS, what we understand is, at least that I understand, is that ISIS must be crushed and destroyed, but it must be done by coalition. And what do I mean by that? I mean the United States must work with other major powers, UK, France, Germany, including Russia. And what we must also do is understand what King Abdullah of Jordan has recently said. And he said that yes, terrorism is an international issue, but it is primarily a Muslim issue because ISIS and other groups have hijacked Islam and have converted it into something which, is, which it is absolutely not. And the fundamental responsibility for defeating ISIS, according to King Abdullah of Jordan, is Muslim troops on the ground supported by the major powers. And that is what I believe. So to answer your question, we have got to do everything that we can to end bigotry, discrimination against women, against gays, against other minorities. But I will also, at the same time, do everything that I can to see that the United States does not get involved in never-ending warfare in the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Sanders, we're going to bring the issues back to domestic issues, and particularly an issue facing not only this next questioner in the South, but around the country. So next we'll hear from Keisha Saffold from Alabama. Hi, my name is Keisha Saffold, and I think I have the best job in the world. I, I think we have the um, most important job on the face of this earth, and probably the least respected job. And I own two child care centers in Dothan, Alabama. My centers are not traditional centers in that they're open um, six days a week and they're open till midnight. And this is based off of my good and bad experience as a single parent. In my former lifetime, I was a news producer and I worked every shift, first, second, and third. And I just found from my experiences, the places that were usually open the hours I needed were in bad neighborhoods and I just felt like I had to sacrifice quality. And I didn't understand that I didn't understand why my daughter deserved less than because her mom had to work after six o'clock. And so for me, because I couldn't afford quality care, it was never about finding a good childcare center. It was about choosing the lesser of the evils. So one night I got off work with my then two year old by my side and we were mugged. And it was horrific. Um, I walked away from TV news altogether. That's what I went to school for. That's what my degree is in. And I came back to Alabama to work in my mother's daycare center, and I went to work on my master's. And we started this child care center. Today, we're the largest privately owned child care center in our area. Um, so I understand, as a parent, how difficult it is to, find, to be able to afford quality child care. I understand, as a preschool teacher, how incredibly low our wages are, and how terrible the benefits, if you're even lucky to get benefits are. And as a child care provider, I understand how difficult it is to provide high quality care and pay your workers real wages. My question to you, Senator Sanders, is how can we change child care in America in a way that'll be beneficial to the teachers, to the parents, and to the child care providers? First of all, I gotta give this lady a hug. Uh, you've touched the subject. Now, I, I know we've got to get out of here within an hour, right? But she really gets me going here. I can go on for about five hours on this. And, and, and I, I hope Jane's not upset that you're kissing uh, other folks. 
on the stage, <laughs> Senator. Uh, Keisha, first of all, thank you so much for the extraordinary work that you are doing. All right. When I talk about a political revolution, when I talk about thinking big, when I talk about radically transforming our priorities in this country, what you said is exactly what I mean. When I was mayor of the city of Burlington, when I was elected, you know what the very first meeting that I held, which is when I ended up meeting my wife Jane, by the way, because she was interested in children's issues as well. We talked about children, okay? And out of that came, to make a long story short, what was I think then and probably now one of the largest child care centers in the city of Burlington, after school programs for our kids, a community, uh, a teen center for kids to play their loud and terrible music. <laughs> but it was a very successful effort. A little league program in the low income area of our state, a kids newspaper, et cetera, et cetera. But let me talk about what Keisha was saying and talk about how crazy the priorities are in this country. Every psychologist who studies the issue understands the most important years of a human being's life in terms of emotional and intellectual development are zero to four. That's a fact. So think for a moment what we do in this country. As Keisha just said, all over this country, including my own state, it is very, very hard for working families to find high quality, affordable childcare or pre-K. What you find is that, and Keisha touched on this as well, you find that many of the people hired in childcare are making what, nine, 10 bucks an hour? Not even that. They're making less than McDonald's workers, and we are entrusting them with our children in the most important years of their life. You can make the case, I will make the case, that people who work with three-year-olds are doing more important wor work than college professors do. Now that I've lost the college professor vote, <laughs> all, right. all right, so what do we do? What we do is understand we're not living in the 1950s when dad went to work and mom stayed home with the kids. Right now, I don't know the exact number, but something like 80, 85% of moms are not staying home with their kids. They can't afford to, they are out working. So what our job is to understand that when we talk about education in America, you're not talking about first grade through high school, you're talking about zero through university level. <laughs> ultimately, Keisha, and I, I'm not promising you we could do this in the first year, but ultimately what we should do is expand public education. Now right now I have a proposal to make public colleges and universities tuition free. <laughs> but on the other end, equally important, is to create a day, and it won't happen tomorrow, it's an expensive proposition, but it must happen, and the goal must be to make sure that every working parent with kids in this country has access to publicly funded, high quality childcare. You know, everything gets tied together. You know, as we all know, one issue is related to another issue, related to another issue. If we have real unemployment in this country of almost 10%, if we have kids who are hanging out on street corners, what about creating many hundreds of thousands of jobs by training our young people to work effectively in childcare centers all over this country?
Well, Keisha, thanks again for what you're doing. Uh, it, is a, it is one of the major issues that, by the way, we never talk about, very rarely talk about. Thank you for bringing Thank it up. Thank you, Senator. Next, we're going to hear... Next, we're going to hear from Ross Gruters, one of Iowa's own. My name is Ross Gruters, and I've... My name is Ross Gruters, and I've worked as... Try this for the third time. My name is Ross Gruters. I've worked as a union locomotive engineer for over a decade now. And we all know that unions have been at the front of the fight for better wages and working conditions. Similarly, environmentalists have been at the front of the fight to protect the health and safety of our communities and our planet. Unfortunately, opponents of both labor and environmentalists work to pit the two against each other. As a union member and an environmentalist, I've worked with Iowa CCI Action and Railroad Workers United, a rank and file caucus of railroad workers to do both, to put the health and safety of our communities and our working economic conditions together and first. So nationally, what that's looked like is organizing across the country with other environmentalists, labor and railroad safety and environmental conferences, along with my fellow environmentalists. Here in the state of Iowa, what that's looked like is protecting our, our land, water, and resources so that we can oppose harmful big oil land grabs like the Bakken pipeline across our state. As you know, Senator Sanders, there are movements all over the world to transition away from fossil fuel dependence. As president, what will you do to support the people working to protect the future of our planet while still ensuring quality economic opportunity for working people? Ross, thank you. And Ross, you're absolutely right that there are reactionaries who want to pit uh, those of us who are environmentalists against those of us who are pro-labor and understand the need for decent paying jobs. But you know and I know there really is not a contradiction. So two things. We have introduced what I am quite confident is, is the most comprehensive climate change legislation in the history of the United States Senate. And what that does is not only impose a tax on carbon to provide major disincentives for the production of greenhouse gases, but what we also do is put a huge amount of money into helping people who in one way or another are impacted by the transformation of our energy system. So we have got to protect those workers who may lose their jobs. Now, in terms of rail, though, what I will tell you, if we create a state-of-the-art rail system, we will create a whole lot of jobs and, by the way, significantly cut back on carbon emissions. So bottom line is, I believe, if we are sensitive and sensible, we can transform our energy system, we can create millions of decent paying jobs in the process, and we can protect those workers who are impacted by the transformation. That's my goal. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Senator, well, our next questioner is Enrique Aguilar from Greater Minnesota. Hello, I'm Marike Aguilar. I'm from the greater Minnesota area, and I'm a US citizen being punished physically, spiritually, emotionally, and psychologically by the broken immigration system as it is today. My husband works over 50 hours a week to provide for my family, and I'm home caring for our two-year-old son. 
with the suffocating fear that at any moment my husband can be deported. I still remember that something as simple as dropping him off at daycare was catastrophic for our family. I got the phone call that my husband had been pulled over, taking our son to daycare. He was in the back seat and I was too far with the only Minnesota driver's license to save my family. I can remember overhearing the police officer say, I'm going to take you in and I'm going to place your son in child protection services as if that was a solution to the problem. That was a direct threat of my family's stability. And I'm tired of living under the fear that I will be pushed into being a single mother, that my son will be forced to live without his father, and that my husband has to fight tooth and nail to be a father to our son. And I want to know, Bernie Sanders, what are you going to do to alleviate this very real fear that is hanging over undocumented families and the citizens that love them? Thank you very much for your willingness to share with us what is a very personal experience. And let me answer it this way. For a start, I work closely with President Obama and agree with him on many issues. I do not agree with him on his policy toward deportation. <laughs> Number two. As soon as I possibly can, we will provide legal protection for 11 million undocumented people in this country. I will do my best to get con Congress to pass comprehensive immigration reform, but if they don't do their job, I will use all of the powers that the President has to protect undocumented people. And thirdly, as President of the United States, I will do everything I can to stand up to the Donald Trumps of the world and their bigotry and their xenophobia and their desire to turn one American against another person. The Trumps of the world and the other demagogues like this understand that the rich get richer and everyone else gets poorer when you divide people up. So you have a Trump who for years was insulting the African American community by telling us that the President of the United States was an illegitimate president not born in America. All right. And then you have, and by the way, stirring the fires of racism in the process, right? Think about it. President of the United States won pretty strong vote, re-elected pretty strong vote, and you got Trump and others going around, oh, he's not a legitimate president. You know, it's a funny thing about that. My dad was born in Poland. I'm the son of an immigrant, okay? I'm the son of an immigrant. Nobody has ever asked me for my birth certificate. Maybe it has something to do with the color of my skin as opposed to Obama's skin. So you got the Trumps of the world trying to divide this country up on racial lines by suggesting our president is not legitimate. And then he comes up with the brilliant idea that all the people coming over from Mexico are criminals and racists and, and rapists and drug dealers. So we're supposed to hate Mexicans. And then his next brilliant idea is we got to prevent Muslims from coming into this country and we're supposed to hate Muslims. 
That type of demagoguery has gone on. He didn't invent it. It's gone on for hundreds of years. It's called scapegoating minorities, and we're supposed to hate people because they're a little bit different than we are. Our job is to stand together, to be united, not divided. And with our unity to, in fact, take on the people who are really wrecking the middle class today, and that is not Latinos who are picking tomatoes at eight bucks an hour, I can tell you that. Thank you, Bernie. So next up, we're gonna hear from George Zornick from The Nation magazine. Senator, thank you. I'd actually like to follow up on that issue. As you know, uh, around Christmas time, the Obama administration stepped up uh, deportation raids for families that came from Central America, particularly child migrants. Um, you wrote to the White House and asked for temporary protective status for these migrants. I'm curious, uh, if you were to become president, what your criteria would be for granting that status, because theoretically over four or eight years, there would be unforeseen crises, other groups asking for that protection. So how do you evaluate their claims, and, and who would you grant it to? Good, good question. And this is what I think. Once again, what this country has historically been about is a beacon of hope. You know, it sounds rhetorical, it sounds overly dramatic, but that's true. All over the world, people look to the United States, Statue of Liberty, they fled oppression, came to a country of freedom and democracy. Now, what you're talking about is the fact that people have fled Guatemala, uh, Honduras, other countries, where communities are literally being run by the drug cartels. What we know is that some people who have been forced to go back have been killed. So if you're asking me what my status is, what a refugee status is in general, it says that when somebody is forced to flee their country because they and their families are unsafe back home, they could be killed, they could be illegally imprisoned. That to me is what refugee status is about and I think we have the moral responsibility to protect those people. And that's what I would do. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Senator, next we're gonna hear from Eugene Lim from Chicago. My name is Eugene Lim. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Illinois is sinking into economic catastrophe because of budget cuts. And I am a hard-working, college-educated American whom budget cuts could kill. I receive Medicaid, uh, which helps me with my depression treatments. And I'm very precariously employed at an underfunded homeless shelter where I help the homeless go back to school and find jobs. So my state-funded shelter turns people away and lays staff off every month because decades of tax dodging by Illinois' wealthiest broke our state budget, which corporate Republicans and Democrats alike refuse to balance by taxing the 1% more. Instead, they shut shelters like mine. They cut Medicaid programs like mine and they defund every public good. Rich people and corporations abuse our political system. Seeking profit, they buy public office like our own Governor Bruce Rauner did with $30 million of his own finance capitalist cash, and then they push budget cuts, and then they push tax laws that lift their profits but stifle the kinds of targeted investment strategies we've been talking about today. So all of this is called austerity. Senator, how will you fight big money in elections? And how will you raise revenue to fight big money's austerity politics? Thank you, Eugene. The story that Eugene is telling about Chicago, 
is a story being told all over America. You know that. What we have is massive income and wealth inequality. So Eugene, what I know you know, is that over the last 30 years in this country, there has been a massive transfer of wealth, a redistribution of wealth from the middle class to the top one-tenth of 1% 1 who have seen in that 30-year period a doubling of the percentage of wealth they own. Middle class is shrinking, real wages are going down, percentage of wealth owned by the top one-tenth of 1% 1 has doubled. What I believe is that now is the time to reverse that trend. So we have a series of proposals and we'll have more which demands that the wealthiest people and the largest corporations start paying their fair share of taxes in our country. Right now, you have major corporations making billions of dollars a year in profit who are stashing their money in the Cayman Islands and Bermuda and other tax havens and in a given year not paying a nickel in federal taxes. Okay? We are going to make them pay their taxes. That's $100 billion a year. We are going to impose a tax on Wall Street speculation. That is an enormous amount of money. And we have other proposals which will bring in a very substantial sum of money into this country which will go back to the states and the cities to create jobs and to protect the most vulnerable people in this country. But the bottom line is, as I said earlier, if I am elected president, the billionaire class will know that the days in which they have it all is over. Thank you, Senator. And one last question. Senator, Senator Sanders, thank you for your patience. We have one last question for the afternoon from Jerome Dillard from Madison, Wisconsin. Good evening. My name is Jerome Dillard and I came here today from Wisconsin. I am a member and an organizer with Expo, Ex-Prisoners Organizing. And I'm also a representative of the formerly incarcerated people and convicted citizens, formerly incarcerated citizens and convicted people movement and their families, a national organization uh, a national organization with many different organizations across the nation. I stand before you today as a family, a formerly incarcerated citizen who served two terms in both our federal prison system and our and state prisons. And I want to say during that period of my life, I witnessed hundreds and hundreds of young men coming through the prison doors, some with extremely long sentences for drugs, and others just cycling in and out of that system. It is through that experience that I began to do the work that I do. And many of our young people in this nation, in my community, do not feel that they are even a part of America. They dare to dream, and once individuals are tagged with arrest and conviction records, their, their opportunities come few and far apart. I can say being an impacted person who once was a returning citizen, I understand the barriers of returning to our, my community. After hundreds and hundreds, after hundreds of applications, I never got a call back. Eventually, I did wind up with a dishwashing job. It's true. I know that 90% of the employers do background checks, and the results of that is many individuals, families, and communities 
are, are being discriminated against and left in poverty. I know that President Obama took an initiative, took, used his executive authority to ban the box. My question to you, uh, Senator Sanders, is when you're elected, will you use executive authority, I would say in the first 100 days, to ban the box for those uh, corporations who have contracts with the federal government? Yes. <laughs> Jerome, thank you very much for the enormously important work you are doing. You guys have assembled quite a panel here of people doing impressive fantastic panel. work. Very impressive panel. Okay. What Jerome is touching on is a huge issue. And it has to do with the fact that, A, we have so many people in prison, and then, B, they get out, and people get out, they don't have, and they can't get jobs. So if you can't get a job and earn an income, you know what? There is a real likelihood you're going to go back to your old environment and end up back in jail again. Not too bright. So I think the answer to your question is, yes, we've got to give people a fair shot at getting their feet back on the ground again, getting back into their communities and earning a living. And let me touch on another issue. There are many, many hundreds of thousands of people who are felons in this country who serve their time but don't have the right to vote. I don't have the exact number in my head, but it is a shockingly high number of African-American men who have lost their right to vote and participate in American democracy. Now, I believe if somebody does his time, he's paying the price, he doesn't lose his democratic rights to participate in our society. that. Please join me in thanking Senator Bernie Sanders for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.